Dear ones, I felt really that there was a need uh, to back up uh, for one Sunday. Uh, that's because I've again and again mentioned the soul and the spirit, and I've continually forgotten that the last time I uh, expounded the scriptural distinctions between them was about a year or a year and a half ago, and many of us were not together then. And so I felt that it would be good tonight to go back and deal with God's plan for the spirit, the soul, and the body. And so that's what I'd like to talk about. And next week then I'd like to get back to uh, desire and the life of the Christian. So uh, really tonight to begin talking and discussing, because the discussion is really as important as the presentation. But I'd like to speak maybe for half an hour on the, the God's plan for the spirit, the soul, and the body. Why do you think God made us? Why do you think God made us? I think a lot of us feel that he made us because he needed us. Now, I think it's important to see, uh, brothers and sisters, that it was not a selfish desire like that that prompted God to make us because he already had all the fellowship he needed now you can see that in John chapter 1 John chapter 1 and you remember the verse yourselves by heart probably John 1 and verse 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God so uh, Jesus, you remember, is the Word. And so Jesus was with God before the creation of the world. You remember Jesus says to the Father uh, on one occasion, uh, Give me the glory which I had with thee before the creation of the world. And you remember it talks about Jesus being the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. So before we were ever thought of, the Father and the Son had a love relationship that we can only imagine and that we will experience in heaven. Uh, you remember, too, that at the very beginning in Genesis, it says, uh, if you look at Genesis chapter 1 and uh, verse 2, you find that there was a third member of that fellowship. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. So there was a Trinity family that had all the love that they needed before we were ever created. And God did not make us because he needed us. He had all the fellowship that he wanted in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. That's the importance of the three persons, you see. They were independent without us. They didn't need us. Now, why did God make us? Well, the answer is really there in, uh, I believe it's First John. And if you look at the first epistle of John, and uh, chapter 1 and verse 3. 1 John 1 and verse 3. It's uh, 1065, dear ones, if you have one of those Bibles. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. And this is the reason the Father made us. So that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And God made us so that we'd have fellowship with him and with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. Much the same, brothers and sisters, as two people in love naturally seem to produce another person to enjoy that love and enjoy that life. Love seems, you see, to create. It seems to bring to birth other people to enjoy the fellowship. And so the Father's love was the reason that we were created. And his love wanted other beings to share the fellowship that he and the Son and the Holy Spirit already possessed. And that's why, you see, he turns to them, you remember, at the beginning of uh, uh, Genesis there, and you remember he is obviously speaking to somebody else. If you look at it there, and it's Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And it's obviously God turning to someone else 
because Genesis 1 and 26, God turns and he says, let us, that is you, uh, my son Jesus, and you Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so the Father decided to make us so that we could enjoy his fellowship. Now, you can see that some things were important if we were going to enjoy God's fellowship. First of all, you know how difficult it is to have fellowship with someone who doesn't speak the same language as yourself. It's a real problem. Or it's very difficult to marry someone who is from a totally different background to yourself. It really is. You spend a lot of time coming together into something that you have in common. In other words, you can see, dear ones, that it's essential if you're going to have fellowship with someone that that someone is like you in some way. Now, that's why the Father made us in his own image, you see. Now, people interpret that variously. Some say, yes, he made us a trinity as he himself is a trinity. He made us with a body like his son had here on earth. He made us with a spirit, like the Holy Spirit has. He made us with a soul, the real part of us, the very real part of us, the real you, just as God the Father is the real you in the Trinity. And some people say that's partly what it means, that God made us in the tripartite image of himself. Some say, well, he made us with a mind like his, so that we could enjoy the beauty of the galaxies as he enjoyed them. He made us with emotions and feelings like his, so that we could feel like him. We could feel joy like him and feel sadness like him and feel love like him. And he made us with wills like his, so that we could make decisions and do things. But you see that God made us in his own image. Now, I think it is important, dear ones, to see that God only carried that up to a certain point. Now, would you look there uh, at the actual creation? account in Genesis 2. And you have it there in Genesis 2 and verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. So God made our body. He took ordinary dust to which we return and he fashioned them into physical bodies like this. And then you see what he did in the rest of the verse. Man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Now, God breathed his own life into us. Now, what kind of life did he breathe into us? Obviously, not the kind of life that we could get from the tree of life. Otherwise, he needn't have provided the tree of life. But do you see that word life in verse 7? That verse, that Hebrew word is chayim. And some of you will recognize it, I think, in Fiddle on the Roof, wasn't it? They toasted lachayim, lachayim. And it means to life. But chayim is the Hebrew plural. In other words, all, every time you come to, it's, either, it's actually a, a yod and a mem. It's a nai, if I can remember it in the English letters now. It's an I and like a Y and M. And every time you come to that in Hebrew, it means lives. Lives. And so many people can see that really when God breathed into our nostrils, he breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. He breathed into our nostrils the breath of mental life and emotional life and volitional life. And then do you see what happened? As a result of God's life combining with our bodies, man became a living, and the King James Version is more correct there. The Hebrew word is nephesh, and it means a living soul. And so you see what happened. God took the corporal part of us, the dust part, the physical part, and he breathed into that part his own life, and as a result, those two parts fused together and formed man's soul. And so you had the spirit of God, the capacity for spirit inside us, combining with our bodies and forming a soul, our mind and emotions and will. 
And that's how we came to be the creatures we are. And that's why the soul is so important in mankind, you see. The soul is the unique part of man. You remember, God never calls the angels souls. But he often calls men souls. You know, again and again, you find in, in the Bible references that men, man is referred to as a soul. Uh, if you see it there in Matthew 10 and verse 28. Matthew 10 and verse 28. Because this was the element in us that distinguished us not only from the animals, but also from the very angels themselves. Matthew 10 and verse 28. And that's why it's important to see that the soul is there. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body. And in Revelation 20 and verse 4, it's more obvious that the reference is to men and yet it is souls. Revelation 20 and verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom judgment was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now do you see, it doesn't mean I saw the souls in the sense of I saw their minds, emotions, and their wills wandering around. It means I saw the lives of those men who had died. And again and again, if you follow through the Bible, you'll find that God often refers to men as souls. And there he's not referring to the, just the soulish part of them, but the soul is so peculiar to man that God often refers to men as souls when he means their whole being. And this is because the soul is the unique part of it. So we ought not to despise the soul. We ought to see that that is the personality part of us. That is the real you. Nevertheless, we ought to see its true place. Now, it is important, you want to see that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Some people say, oh, yes, uh, you're right, Pastor. Uh, we're just referred to as souls because, you see, that's all we have. We have our body, then we have our soul. We have two parts. Now, dear ones, that is dualism. That is the belief of modern psychology. Modern psychology says, listen, all you people have is you have a body, and that produces behavioral psychology, and you have inside that a soul. You have mind, emotions, and a will, and you have nothing deeper than that. You have no spirit. Now, do you see that we throw ourselves into the hands of the psychologists if we are unscriptural in this? And some of us tend to be. Some of us want to say, oh, yeah, Pastor, we have only two parts of us. We have a body and a spirit. Now, dear one, the soul is different from the spirit. And we need to see the distinction. That's what's happened to the great majority of churches today. They have made, made no distinction between the spirit and the soul. And so the psychologists and the psychiatrists seem to be able to do as good a job as the pastors. And loved ones, I, I know I did courses and courses in psychology, in seminars. Because the whole move in Britain at that time was that way. And now the whole move in America is that way. Because, you see, we've made no distinction between soul and spirit. And so we say, ah, what's wrong with a person is what's wrong with their soul. The Greek word for soul is psyche. P-S-Y-C-H-E. Psychology, obviously. Psychology is the knowledge of the psyche or the soul. Now, do you see that the Bible says, Though the soul is the personality part of man, though the soul is the part that distinguishes man from the animals and from the angels, and though the Bible at times therefore refers to men as souls when the Bible means their whole beings, yet there is a clear distinction between spirit, soul, and body. Now, would you like to look at that distinction? And you've often looked at it before. But let's look just once more. First Thessalonians 5. And verse 23. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 23. May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly. 
And may you, and you see the order. The order is God's order, the most important first. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, it's not enough to say, you see, oh, that's the Bible just saying, you know, may the whole lot of you be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. You know, the Bible is God's inspired word. The Bible, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit so that the men who wrote the Bible wrote exactly what God meant. And God didn't just generalize, you know. When he says spirit and soul and body, he means spirit and soul and body. And loved ones, it is vital for us as Christians to retain that distinction and to see that there is a spirit, a soul, and a body. Otherwise, you verge into psychological religion, you see. You either verge into that or you end up with people filled with the spirit but living by their mental and emotional powers. That is why, for instance, many spirit-filled groups end up preoccupied with the emotion that the singing of choruses or the singing in tongues produces because they themselves have not moved into a distinction between soul and spirit and though they are filled with the spirit they worship in the strength of the soul that's why certain theolog theological groups who want to find their way back to orthodoxy if they don't make a distinction between spirit and soul, they begin to move forward in the strength of their purely intellectual insight. And you know, you've met those dear ones. There's a hardness to them. They're speaking truth, but they're speaking it with a hardness. It's as if truth itself will conquer, you know. Now, you see, truth is truth coming through uh, inspired and sanctified personality. That will conquer. But there's no such thing as just orthodoxy on its own. The Bible always talks not about orthodox doctrine, but about sound doctrine. Doctrine that produces, the Greek word means health, health-giving doctrine. And so it's vital to keep the distinction between soul and spirit and body. Now, some of us uh, may feel, well, really, is it necessary to know that there is a difference between them? And is it necessary to know the distinction in your own life? Well, would you look at Hebrews 4, dear ones? which points out that, yes, it is important at a certain part of our lives to know that there is a distinction between spirit and soul. And it's Hebrews 4, you remember, and uh, verse 12. Hebrews 4 and 12, and it's 1,046 in that Bible. <laughs> Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. Now, you see that the Bible says that the word of God is a sword and will pierce and divide between the soul and the spirit. Now, why bother dividing if it doesn't need to be divided? You know, The Bible does, just doesn't go around doing things for pleasure or for the sake of doing it. So if it is that the Bible is the word of God and divides between soul and spirit, there must be some reason and some need for it. Now you see, dear ones, that we need to deal with these passages when we're dealing with this whole uh, level, these levels of the personality. We need to see that these are scriptural. These are not thought up by some man. We may say, this is an infinite word of God, brother, and you have a miserable little finite mind. And every time you take this infinite word of God and try to divide it up for us, you make it less true. Yes, I'll agree, brother. That finally only the word of God can be interpreted by the Holy Spirit to each of us. Nevertheless, do you see, we do need to make some attempt to draw out the implications of this word. And we need to see that this distinction is written into the word. Would you let me just caution here? Do you see that we're not saying that I can take out this and say, there's my soul. Okay, doctor, there's my soul. And then I can take out this and say, okay, pastor, there's my spirit. They aren't things. We agree with the modern psychologists. You can't divide us up into different parts. We are all one personality. All you can say is we live at different levels. And what we're saying is you can live at a physical level. And you can live at a soul level. 
an emotional, mental, and volitional level. And you can live at a spiritual level. Now, dear ones, I agree with you that when I utter a prayer, I'm living at all those levels at once. If I'm really praying in the spirit. Because the prayer is really coming from my spirit, and yet it's being applied through my mind in words and in language, and coming out through my tongue so that you can hear it. So I agree that all the levels are working at one time. But you do see that it is important to know that we are moving at the level of our spirits. And that's the real need, you see. Because God's plan was this. He made us with these capacities. But he didn't make us like himself. Now, did you get that? He didn't make us like himself. He made us like himself in that he made us in his image with the capacities to be like him. But he didn't make us robots who could not do other than be like him. In fact, he made us with a body and with a soul and a spirit. And then you see what he did in Genesis chapter 2, it is, and verse 9. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God, in spite of the fact that he had given us life, natural life, mental, emotional, and physical, and volitional life, and a capacity for spiritual life, he put another source of life and made it available to us. Now, dear ones, that tree of life is the life of the Holy Spirit. It's the life that became available in Jesus. And it was the Father's will that we should go to Jesus as he walked among us, and we should, by our own choice, choose to receive that spiritual life of God into our spirits. Now, loved ones, do you see, what we had was created life. It was mental life, emotional life, volitional life, and physical life, and a capacity for spiritual life. But it was up to us to choose to receive this uncreated spiritual life into our beings. And it was up to us to choose that. Now you see why God made it that way, loved ones. If he had made us like himself with an inability to do anything but be part of the Trinity family, he would not have had a family. He'd have had a family of captive robots. And this is why, dear ones, he made us with capacity. And he made us with the capacity to receive his uncreated spiritual life into our spirits But he said, you must choose. You must choose to opt into my Trinity family. You have the ability to become like us. You have the capacity that makes you superficially like us. But you can only become like us by being born of our uncreated life. And that is life is available to you through my Son, through the tree of life, through the Holy Spirit. And only there, if you're born, of my eternal, uncreated life, can you become like the Trinity family? Well, that's good sense, dear ones. You cannot really become like my father unless you were born of my mother. That's the only thing that would really make you look like my father or give you his traits. And it's so with the father. The only way we can become like the father is to receive the uncreated spiritual Trinity life from the Holy Spirit by means of Jesus, into our spirits. And that uncreated spiritual life contains the genes of God. It contains his spirituality, which will work out into our minds and fill our minds with his spirituality. It contains his own blessedness and joy, which will flow out through our emotions and give us real happiness and real joy and peace. It contains the liberty of his own will, that will flow out through our wills and give our wills liberty from self. But do you see, the only way we can become like God is to be born of God by receiving that spiritual uncreated life into us. And the Father told us that that's what we had to do. And then you see what he wanted to happen after that. You see what he told us to do in Genesis 1. And it's in verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said to them, 
Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God wanted us to receive that uncreated spiritual life into our spirits and then to go out into the world and allow that spirit life to pour through our minds and emotions and our wills and to discipline them and make those minds and emotions and wills the servant of the spirit and then flow out through the body and begin to subdue the earth and bring it under God's command and will and then move from this earth to the other planets and the galaxies until we had brought the whole universe under God's will. And you see, by exercising ourselves in fulfilling that great commission, we would allow that spiritual life that had come into our spirits to flow out through our souls and discipline them and make them servants of the Spirit. And that way we would become totally like the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Not only because we were filled with the spiritual uncreated life in our spirits, but because our minds, emotions, and wills had voluntarily become the servants impregnated with this Holy Spirit. And so, you see, there were really two choices that we had to make. The Father wanted us to choose to receive the Holy Spirit and to be dependent on him for our life and to be dependent on him for all our needs. And secondly, to allow that Holy Spirit to utterly control the soul part of us, the mind and the emotions and the will. And that was the Father's plan. In other words, it was his plan from the beginning that we should be born of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and then that we should allow that Spirit to distinguish between our souls and our spirits and to control our souls completely. Now you know what in fact happened. The rebellion in the Garden of Eden was a rebellion of the body and the soul. Man said virtually to God in his own being, we will not live by your life. You have given us, uncreate, you have given us created physical life. We will use that life. And we will get what that life needs to feed it from the world. And you see, that's the heart of the, uh, the story in Genesis 3, really. You remember uh, that... Eve looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis 3. And uh, Genesis 3 and verse 6. Genesis 3 and 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that is, that she could get all that her physical body needed from the world itself without depending on God. She could get food from the crops and the fruits of the tree. She could get that for food. And that it was a delight to the eyes. And that's a delight to the eyes to make you feel happy and glad. And she saw that she could get all the enjoyment she wanted for her emotions from the world. Boy, there was a beautiful green world out there. She could get all the satisfaction emotionally that she wanted. I suppose she never foresaw water skiing and flying. But in her own way, she saw that you could get all the enjoyment from your, for your emotions from the world itself, from the natural world. And you see that she, immediately she began to see what she could get. The father wanted her to pour out life through her emotions and through her body so that she'd fill the world. But she saw that she could get from the world and empty the world. Empty it of all its oil. Empty it of all its natural resources. Of all its pu purity. Of all its fresh water. And so we come to this position, you see, we're in today. And then you see, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. And she began to play about in her own mind. And her sons and her daughters did. And you remember at the very beginning of the world, obviously from the Inca civilizations, we can see that at the beginning of time, men were incredibly clever. And they used the abilities that they had mentally to begin to increase their wisdom through manipulating the world for their advantage. And that was the fall of mankind, you see. It was a rebellion of the body and a rebellion of the soul. And you see what happened man began to be dominated by his body and his soul. Now, loved ones, what is needed is that the whole thing should be reversed, you see. The tragedy is that we, as unregenerate people, live for what we can get through our bodies and live for the independent life in our souls. And therefore, there is a great threefold need when we come to Jesus 
first of all, uh, really, there is a need for God to be able to forgive us and give the tree of life back to us, the life of the Holy Spirit back. And in order to do that, someone has to die for us so that God can return again that tree of life to us. That's the first need. And Jesus died for that. The second need is that we not only believe that, but we go to the tree of life and we receive the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we're in the old position that Adam was in, where the tree of life was right there, but he never touched it. Now, you see, many Christians are like that. Many of them know that their sins are forgiven, and they know that Jesus has died for them, and they will say again and again, boy, we're glad that God has given us back the Holy Spirit, that he's available for us, but they don't receive the Holy Spirit. Or they receive him and hold him into a little part of their lives and don't allow him to fill them and to be utterly dependent on him. That's the second need, that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the third need is that they do what God originally intended. They allow that Holy Spirit to control their souls and to integrate their souls and bring them back under the order of the Spirit. And, of course, begin the flow of life in the right direction. And that's what we talk about, you know, when we talk about the soul powers going to the cross. The soul powers have two mistakes. They are independent, working on their own, and secondly, they're working in a reverse direction. They're working from the body. The body dominates the soul, and the spirit is virtually suppressed completely. What needs to be done is that the spirit is filled with God's spirit and becomes alive, and then the direction begins to flow back the way God wants it to. And that the soulish powers begin to come under the control of the spirit. So there are two needs, dear ones, with the soulish powers. That they begin to work from the spirit outwards. And secondly, that they begin to be healed and disciplined by the Holy Spirit. Because you see, at the moment, they're like uh, anything that doesn't have sufficient life. If you don't have sufficient air coming in through your nostrils, then you'll begin to have symptoms inside your body of a lack of air. Now, if you do for a long time without the Holy Spirit, your mind becomes impaired. Your emotions become unbalanced. Your body becomes weakened. And that's the state most of us are in. And so it's necessary after we're filled with the Holy Spirit to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to strengthen our minds and to rule our minds, begin to balance our emotions and begin to strengthen our bodies. And that is the movement that comes about. Now, dear ones, really, I do feel that I should just very briefly give you some scriptural references to the soul and perhaps if we have time to the spirit so that you have some understanding of it now uh, I've just taken a few of them so uh, maybe we could just look at at the few that I have first of all would you look at Psalm 41 and verse 2 and this is so that we should begin to see that the scripture teaches the distinction between soul and spirit and goes further than that. The scripture, by its references to soul, indicates some of the functions of the soul. So Psalm 41 and verse 2. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. Thou dost not give him up to the will of his enemies. Now the Hebrew word is nephesh soul and it's translated soul in the King James Version and again and again when the Hebrew Bible talks about nephesh or soul it is talking about as it's translated there in the RSV the will so the will you see the volitional part of us is part of our souls and that's what we mean many Christians live in their souls they serve God with their souls they're willful people you know they want to do it And they insist on, yeah, you should go to this meeting, brother. This is the church to go to. You should go to this meeting. And there's not the sweetness of Jesus come back. Not the sweetness of Jesus' spirit. But they're serving in their will. That old will has not been broken. Their soulish powers have not come to the cross. Uh, Deuteronomy 21 and verse 14. Deuteronomy 21 and verse 14. Deuteronomy 21 and 14. Then, if you have no delight in her, you shall let her go where she will. Now, the Hebrew is according to her soul, according to her nephesh. And so, again, you see, you'll find that soul 
means will in the Bible. And so that one of the soul functions is our will. Now, would you look at another one? It's Lamentations 3 and verse 20. And that's uh, page 709 in that uh, Bible we use in the morning. Let's see one. Lamentations 3 and verse 20. And uh, another function of the soul. Lamentations 3 and 20. I hope you're having as much trouble with lamentations as I had. <laughs> That's why I got the page number. <laughs> lamentations 3 and 20. Yes, you're having trouble. <laughs> If I can help you, it's before Ezekiel and after Jeremiah. Lamentations 3 and 20. My soul continually thinks of it and is bound down within me. Now, obviously, what thinks is our mind, you see. So when the Bible refers to soul, thinking, it obviously means that one of the parts of our soul is our mind. And you get that again in Proverbs 3 and 21 and 22. Proverbs 3 and 21 and 22 Proverbs 3 and 21 and 22 my son keep sound wisdom and discretion let them not escape from your sight and they will be life for your soul now obviously wisdom and discretion we connect with our minds you see and so when the bible talks about soul it means at times our mind so another function of the soul is our mind. And you can begin to see where the psychologists got their name psychology from. Really, many things stem back to the Bible, strangely enough, you know. And it is really from the soul that uh, they got the meaning of, of psychology, that it includes the uh, emotions. Really, they were not so brilliant after all, you know, discovering that they ought to deal with the will and the mind. And then, uh, if you like to look at 1 Samuel 18, and verse 1, 1 Samuel 18 and verse 1, I'm sure these are not the only functions of the soul, but they are perhaps three of the primary functions. 1 Samuel 18 and verse 1, and this particular reference refers to the uh, emotion of affection, you see. When he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And the second soul, of course, means as his own being. As we said, the Bible uses soul at times to refer to the whole man. But the first soul is obviously the emotion. When you love a person, you love them with your emotion. And so the Bible, when it refers to soul, refers to emotion. I'll just give you quickly the other references, dear ones, so that you'll have them. Uh, the emotion of affection is in 1 Samuel 18 and 1. And then Psalm 4, 84 and verse 2. Psalm 84 and verse 2 refers to the emotion of desire. You see, we desire with our emotions. Uh, Psalm 84 and verse 2. Uh, and that's when we're walking through Dayton's and that desire for that lounge, you see, that lounge chair or that new dress comes upon us, there we're walking in our soul, you see. And we're still walking in reverse direction. We can be baptized with the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, all that. But if we're walking with that desire drawing us, that's what brings unrest to us. You know it. You desire a thing and you live for it and live for it, and it brings unrest. That's why, dear ones, I've shared with you the need to bring those soulish powers to the cross, because they can cause you as much unrest as that old will that is independent of God, you see, that resists God. That's the emotion of desire. And then Psalm 42 and verse 5. Psalm 42 and verse 5. And uh, that is the emotion of feeling. And maybe we could just pause to look at that for a moment because it affects so many of us. Psalm 42 and verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Now, you can see the reason for coming to a cross experience as far as our soulish powers go. Because it's in our emotions 
but we experience sadness and depression. And that's where many of us make a mistake, you see. We think, oh, in a service on Sunday morning, if our emotions are roused to the height, that's great. No, it's bad. Because if you live in your emotion there, Satan will, make it, will find it very easy to draw you down into the emotion of depression later on in the day. And it's the Father's will, you see, that our soulish powers should come to an experience of the cross and be broken. Because you're right, they are not evil in themselves, but they are natural, and they are independent, strictly speaking, of the Holy Spirit life of God. And they can be used to, by Satan to draw us back into independence. So you can see, the ones, that there is a real distinction in the Bible between spirit, soul, and body. And uh, I think it would be unfair at this point to go on into the distinctions of the spirit. And I will try to do that uh, uh, on another Sunday evening. But I think it's vital to see that we are a tripartite being. We are tripartite beings. And there is a need not only to receive and be filled with the Holy Spirit in our spirits, but there is a need to allow the Holy Spirit to bring our soulish powers under the control of our spirit so that we no longer live by those soulish powers, but they are controlled by the Spirit of God. Now, would you have questions, John? Brother? That's right. That's right. It seems to me, Dave, that the whole meaning... Now, somebody could correct me on this, uh, but I think the whole meaning of the resurrection is that the body will uh, be raised up and the soul and they will be united with the spirit and that the whole the whole three will come together in unity before they come before the father and i think that's the meaning that the spirit does not die but the body and soul as it were are dead because the spirit is no longer in them and that's where at times you know i remember with my dad when he was lying there in the in ireland we uh, are foolish really we keep the body in the the casket in the house and I remember there came a, a time about oh six hours you know after he was uh, dead when I sensed that he was no longer there you know now one can give that many explanations but I think that many of us have sensed that there comes a time when the spirit we seem to sense that that person is no longer the people we knew and so it seems that the resurrection the whole three will be united together That's right. That's right. Good, good. Uh, that, in other words, that in heaven, no, the whole tripartite personality, yes, will be alive. The only difference will be we'll have a spiritual body, like unto the glorious body of Jesus, and therefore it will be free, presumably, to move throughout the universe and will be free from the weaknesses that our own body has. And it seems that then part of the change in the twinkling of an eye would be that the Holy Spirit would then completely renew our minds and our emotions and our will. And so that's why we say we're not perfect now as we will be then. Yeah. It seems to me, Dick, that when the Bible talks about the heart, it talks about it much in the same way as it talks about the soul. At times, it refers to the heart as the inner being of mankind, just the deepest part. So that at times, if it means the heart of an unregenerate man, it means the deepest part of that man. At times, if it talks about the heart of a regenerate man, it means the spirit of that man. The, the heart of an unregenerate man would be a soul, because a spirit is really dead to God. And the heart of a, non, a regenerate man would be his spirit. And at times it talks that way. But for instance, in Deuteronomy 6 and 5, obviously it, it, it means something even different from that again, in thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and strength and mind. So it's the same as with the soul, Dick. No, you can't mathematically divide it, brother. You can't say that every time soul means this, or every time soul means that. And that's where I think we verge into purely intellectual distinctions that get us into trouble. And I think it's the same with heart. What it certainly doesn't mean is the blood pump. That's undoubtedly true. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, what, what made Adam and Eve rebel was it ignorance of what they had in God. And brother, the will remains a mystery. And every theologian will say that, you know, the will is left a mystery by God. 
And uh, as far as I can go is Dostoevsky's statement, you know. He said, uh, the only reason a man will act against his own best advantage is in order to have his own way. And <laughs> I don't know, brother. That's it. You can say, you know, it was the deception of Satan. You can say that uh, that is why God is able to forgive man at all, because man did not originate sin. Uh, Satan originated sin. And you can say it was the deception of Satan, and Satan said, now you'll be as God if you do this. You'll be as God. And so he deceived man into thinking that, well, he would 